kept there watching over silent flocks by night behold throughout the heavens there shone a holy light go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born feared and trembled when to above the earth bring out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth hail the Savior's birth go tell it on the mountain over the hills and The humble Christ was born and brought us God's salvation, the blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is We're so glad that you are here today, and it's a pleasure for us to be with you. We apologize for being just a little bit late today. Well, I don't know, for some reason, maybe because the weather turned cold, we're just moving a little bit slow. But we're here, and we're glad that you are here with us as well. You know, we here at Ottawa's First Christian Church, we're a welcoming congregation and a welcoming church and we are very pleased, we're very happy to share this hour of worship with each and every one of you. If you're a first-time viewer, or even if you've been with us many times before, we're glad you're here. If you are a member of another denomination, we are so grateful that you have tuned in this morning. And if you are a member uh, of this church, we're glad to welcome you as well. If you are at home, if you're in Ottawa's, one of Ottawa's first-class nursing homes, or even if you're in a dormitory room this morning, or a hospital room, or maybe even sometimes we have folks who are in some place of incarceration, please know that each and every one of you is welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Pastor Bob Colrick, and I'm joined by our outstanding audio-visual expert, Mr. Steve Borkowski, and half of our incredibly talented worship team. Dale is here today, and Amy will be with us probably next week. And uh, we are so thankful for Dale and for Amy to lead us in our music. Today we've just got half of it, and that's Dale. But he's, he's ready, raring to go, just as you heard him just a moment ago. Let's begin with a call to worship. This Advent... We hope and pray for joy as we journey together, sight for the blind and healing for the sick, freedom for the prisoners and good news for the poor, release for the oppressed with justice for all and love for each other. We yearn and we pray for the coming of God's kingdom for all those who dream. 
you know, Dale did such a wonderful job. Let's get, a, let's, let's get him to play again. Uh, go tell it on the mountain and we can all sing together with him. Okay, here we go, Dale, take it away. Well, shepherds kept their watching over silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens, has shown a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born and brought us God's salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. I'd like to offer now a opening prayer, but I have a reminder for all of you children that are out there and watching this morning, make sure that you make your way close to the television or however you're watching this program, because we are going to have a children's message in just a few moments. So round up all the kids and get them close for the children's message. Right now, let's bow in prayer. Creator God, Scripture is flooded with dreamlike images. The lion lying down with the lamb, justice rolling like a mighty river, swords being beaten into plowshares, the prisoner being set free. Good news to the oppressed, the whole world is rejoicing. You know, to our human ears, God, there are times when these words can sound like nothing more than a far off dream. However, we know that what it is to dream, and to dream is to hope, and to hope is to imagine, and to imagine is to wonder, and to wonder is to believe, and to believe is to live and breathe for your promised day. And so God, this morning, give us the strength to listen as we dream and God, for down deep, we know that your words are the very thing that we need. In your name we pray, amen. I'd like to continue our service this morning with the lighting of the third Advent candle. Today we light the Advent candle of joy. Last week we lit the candle of peace, and the week before we lit the candle of hope. Today we light the candle of joy. Are you a joyful person? So often we let our happiness depend upon our surroundings. Often our joy is dependent upon how people treat us or how our situation turns out. We may even believe that it is impossible to be happy in our particular situation. Yet, you know, God helps us find a joy that is not dependent on what goes on around us. It is a joy that comes from inside. It is a joy that comes from seeing how much God loves us. It's a joy that comes from having a Savior who reaches out to us. It is a joy that comes from the way that God values us. On this third Sunday of Advent, we light three candles. We light the first candle and call it hope. The second we call the peace candle because of the peace that Jesus brings. 
Today, we light the third Advent candle, the candle of joy. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 reads like this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, watching over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Jesus' birth is good news that shows how each of us is highly favored and valued by God. You know, that's a great reason for us to be filled with joy. Would you bow with me in prayer? Dear God, thank you for the great news that Jesus has brought to each and every one of us in the world. Send peace now into our hurried hearts as we rejoice in the wonderful joy he brings. In his name we pray, amen. Now I'd like to invite all of the children to come forward for the children's message. You can move up a little bit closer to the television screen if you'd like, because I've got a special message just for you kids today. And uh, I want to start out this morning with a, uh, a joke or two, maybe, okay? You know what this is? All of you have seen this before. This is a candy cane. I just love these mint candy canes, but what color is it? It is red and white, right? Well, what if it happened to be red, white, and blue? What would you call this? It was red, white, and blue. What do you call it? You call it a sad candy cane. <laughs> oh, I know, just kind of a silly joke, isn't it? Well, I know another joke. Maybe you'll like this one a little better. What does Christmas end with? What does Christmas end with? We know we start with Christmas kind of being singing songs and having fun, and, and then we open presents like the baby Jesus got presents from the wise men. But what does Christmas end with? It ends with an S, silly. Christmas ends with a, the letter S. And then, uh, let's see, I have one more. Let's see what it is. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, what's the only kind of ball that doesn't bounce. What's the only kind of ball that doesn't bounce? A snowball. <laughs> a snowball doesn't bounce, does it? You know, this is a wonderful time of the year. We just lit the candle of joy, and we are joyful people. When Jesus was born a long time ago, about 2,000 years ago, he was born to a lot of people who really weren't very happy. They were very sad. They were oppressed. And, 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 and it was not a peaceful time. It was not a good time for them. And then they received the good news that Jesus, the Savior, was born. And the Bible says that there was laughter in their mouths and there was joy in their tongues. And you know, I think we feel the same way too, don't we? We love to have laughter. We love to have joy in our lives. And that's what the birth of the baby Jesus is really all about. And so when we think of joy, what do we think of? We think of our wonderful, loving families. We think of Christmas time and singing those wonderful songs at Christmas time. Of course, we think about sitting down to a meal. That's a very joyful thing, isn't it, for us? And then, of course, we gather around and we unwrap presents. That's a very joyful thing, too, isn't it? You know, the baby Jesus was born so that we might have joy in our lives. Joy is a happy thing. It's not a maybe a <laughs> laugh out loud thing. But it's a joy, a happy, a good thing that we feel down deep in our hearts. And so let us be joyful.
this Christmas season. Let's have a quick prayer. God, thank you for all the wonderful children that we have out there. We thank you, God, for them, and we, we pray, God, that you would bless them as they grow and help them to do the things that you would have them to do. Thank you, God, for our children. All of this we pray in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask now that uh, Dale come and lead us in some wonderful songs. Dale, take it away. Thank you so much, Dale. We appreciate that beautiful singing, and we love to sing those hymns. This morning, I would like to continue a Christmas series that I started here a couple of weeks ago. The basic title of it is, Why Christmas? 
And uh, the first uh, week that we did this was part one and then part two. And so this is Christmas, Why Christmas, part three. I'd like to use that wonderful and familiar scripture that all of you are familiar with. I'd like to read it again for you, please. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those, those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And there were shepherds living out and in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And angels of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, he is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of God's word. You know, this morning, this is a wonderful time of joy. And I'm just so joyful, I'm so thankful, I'm so impressed with the people who have been leading us in our worship for the last uh, few weeks as we have celebrated this wonderful time of Advent. I want to thank in particular uh, Mr. Steve, and, uh, who's our audiovisual man. He does a wonderful job. We're very grateful to him. And then I also want to thank our song leaders as well. They just sing so good, and we just enjoy the songs they sing. It, it, it's just a, a wonderful joy to hear their, their great message in music. You know, Advent is an inspiring and meaningful time of preparation in our lives. The first Sunday of Advent was two weeks ago. And the sanctuary had been colorfully decorated with all the trimmings and symbols of Advent and Christmas, the colors and the candles and the banners and the ribbons and the wreaths, and of course that magnificent tree that we see in the background. These decorations all help us prepare for and proclaim the coming of the Savior. A big thanks to all those who helped in the sanctuary decorations. That Sunday, we lit the first Advent candle, and traditionally the first candle is the candle of hope. In lighting that candle, we remembered that the Savior who would come would be called Wonderful Counselor. And all wrapped up in this name for the Savior is our hope. 
in so many ways and for so many people, our world is a place of despair and a place of sorrow and a place of brokenness. You know, I remember a few years ago when the General Assembly of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ met and they adopted this wonderful statement. It says, the Disciples of Christ are a movement for wholeness in a broken and fragmented world. The first candle of Advent comes to remind us that Jesus is the one who cares. Jesus is the one who sustains and heals. Jesus is the one who brings hope for our weary lives. Last Sunday was the second Sunday of Advent, and we lit, lit the candle of peace. We remembered that Jesus told us, recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, peace. I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We know that Jesus brings peace to our troubled hearts. Ours is a world of so much conflict and so much tension and so much discord on so many levels. What we long for in our lives is peace. And only Jesus Christ can bring peace to our world and to our lives. In fact, Jesus Christ is peace. We proclaim to the world that there will only be peace in the world as we understand the words and teachings of peace that Jesus gave us. Today, of course, we lit the third candle of Advent, the candle of joy. In lighting the candle of joy, we are reminded that when we face trials, when we face hardships and difficulties, our strength is in Jesus Christ. He is the one who gives strength to the weary and power to the weak. The joy that Jesus affords is not the mirthful giggles of someone who hears or sees something funny. The joy that Jesus brings is not dependent on what goes, around, uh, goes on around us. Instead, it is a deep and everlasting joy that we feel even when we don't feel like laughing. It is a joy that sustains us and there, even in the world of times, turtle or bad times, because we know that no matter what happens, God loves us. I want to continue today to ask the question, why Christmas? I believe this sermon title, this, this question, can, serve, can, can serve as the jumping off point for some words I believe God wants us to hear as we seek to navigate the sometimes rough and grueling and dark and vague waters of Christmas. We probably ought to ask why often. Not just Christmas, but why do we do this? And why do we do that? Or think the way we do. To ask why causes us to pause and it causes us to think, and it causes us to consider, and to ponder, and to reflect. You know, I love the word cogitate. Perhaps some of you have heard the word cogitate. To pause and to think causes us to reevaluate and to understand and absorb a, th a thought or a situation. When we cogitate, on the question, why Christmas? It causes us to consider the meaning of Christmas and what was God doing as God sent his son to earth to be our savior. What was God thinking? We've already done a little of this in considering why Christmas. Two weeks ago, we asked the question and we reasoned because we desperately and urgently need Christmas. That's why Christmas. Not season's greetings, not 
happy holidays or seasonal celebration, we need Christmas. Christmas. Last week we asked the question, why Christmas? And we considered that in Christmas, God was doing something big. God was doing something important. As is the case with a lot that happens today, we don't know the significance of an event for some time down the road. It may take days or months or even years to really know the implications of an event. We just know that Christmas is huge. We may not know everything, but we get the strong feeling that in that first Christmas, God was doing and God was planning and God was implementing something great and something big. Today we again ask, why Christmas? And I believe we ask that because we know of the great joy that is so much a part of Christmas. Joy that is inherent in Christmas. The joy that becomes a part of us and transforms us as we enter the world of the spirit of Christmas. If we take the John chapter, Gospel of John chapter 14, verse 27 scripture and change the word peace to joy, I think we get a hint of why Christmas is so important. Peace or joy I leave with you. My joy or my peace I give you. I do not give to you the kind of joy or peace as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid, Jesus says to us even today. You know, our world needs so much, especially right now. We're so glad that perhaps a, uh, an injection of vi a vaccine to keep us from getting COVID, we need that so much in our world today. We, there are people in our world who need food. There are people in our world, including our country, that needs clean air and clean water. We need to have more trust and we need to have more acceptance in our world. We need to have more love and we need more peace and we need more joy. There's so many things that are happening in our world today and we need this joy. The third Sunday of Advent is the Sunday of joy. This Sunday is something called Gaudette Sunday. That's a French word. It means to rejoice. It means to cheer. It means to rejoice in. It means to celebrate. It means to delight. It means to express the joy that is in our hearts. Today, today we lit the pink candle on this Sunday because we think of the coming of the Savior as being like the coming of a new day, the dawn of a new and better day. We see the sky in the east turns pink with the rise of the sun, the Son of God. And so pink is the color that reminds us of that joy. In each new day, there is the hope of joy. In the beautiful movie, the Christmas Miracle of Jonathan Toomey. We find a lonely and confused boy of about 10 years old. His life has been devastated by the death of his father in war. We know that a wood-carved manger scene, a nativity set, was the boy's fondest link to his father. It was a time of happiness, a time of closeness, and a time of security. But in moving to a new home because of worsening financial resources, the manger scene is lost. And once again, the boy is plunged into deep sadness. Thomas' mother, Susan, has found a bitter, and resentful, cynical woodcarver named Jonathan Toomey, who we learn has lost his wife and child to illness and she has persuaded him to carve what she hopes will be a replacement manger scene for the boy that will, in some small way, revive her son and bring back glad and pleasant 
memories, some joy to life. In a moment of insight and sensitivity, Thomas' mother asked Gloomy to me if he won't allow Thomas to watch him carve the new manger scene. To me, for a reason he does not understand, reluctantly agrees, and slowly a bond of trust and confidence grows between Thomas and Toomey. As Jonathan Toomey carves the figures, we traditionally believe that there, when Jesus that was born, those figures were there. The sheep, a cow, Mary and Joseph, the three wise men, who probably came much later, but we like to have them in the scene, and of course, the baby Jesus. And Thomas watches closely and carefully with a keen eye and to Jonathan Toomey's annoyance, he begins to offer suggestions. Mr. Toomey, is that my cow you're carving? Yes, Thomas. Well, Mr. Toomey, it doesn't look like my cow. Cows are cows, Thomas. Mr. Toomey, my cow was proud. Proud? Pish posh. Cows are cows. They cannot be proud. Mr. Toomey, my cow was proud because he had chosen to be born in his barn. So he felt proud. And later, as Jonathan Toomey carves and Thomas watches, Mr. Toomey, is that my angel you're carving? Yes, Thomas. What's wrong with it? Well, Mr. Toomey, my angel was kind of, sort of, important. Important? Pish posh, of course the angel was important. It's an angel. How can I make it look more important? I don't know, Mr. Toomey, but I'm sure you will. And then there is this wonderful clip that you are about to see. Mr. Toomey? Excuse me? Mr. Toomey? May I ask you a question? If you must. Is that one of my sheep you're carving? And who else's sheep would it be? Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but, well, you're carving my sheep wrong. It is a very nice sheep, Mr. Toomey. Nice? Very nice. But? Well, it doesn't look... Doesn't look what? Happy. Happy? Happy? Pish posh, it's a sheep. Sheep are sheep. They're not supposed to look happy. My sheep are happy. Why? What did they have to be happy about? They knew they were with the baby Jesus. Mr. Toomey, my sheep were happy. To which Mr. Toomey, who has no happiness in his life, replies, what is there to be happy about? Sheep are sheep, they're not supposed to be happy. My sheep were, Mr. Toomey, because they were there with the baby Jesus. You know, when we ask why Christmas this Christmas, I think we will see that because in the Christ child, there is joy, there is a delight, there is a happiness that is difficult to define, yet is very much there. And in fact, there is a joy that surrounds all that we do at Christmas. The scripture, which is the basis of our thoughts on Christmas, tells us of this joy the shepherds were terrified, but the angel tells them of a great joy. For a child has been born. 
And we know how the shepherds responded. They rushed off to find the baby, which is a lesson for you and me in and of itself. They went in search of the joy. And they find the baby lying in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. You know, the Savior was born in a stable. There was no other place for Mary to give birth, no time to search for a more suitable place for a child to be born. Sometimes poor travelers in the days when Jesus was born had no choice but to bunk down in the stables with the animals. The manger is in a stable where you find farm animals. Not a pretty place. Dirty smells and noisy. Yet the scripture tells us that this foul place was a place of joy. Why? Because where Jesus is, God is. Where Jesus is, the Savior is. Where Jesus is, there is joy. You know, sometimes I think we're afraid of joy. We're afraid that it won't last. We're afraid to express joy because someone might think we're foolish, that we're unwise, or maybe that we're kind of weird. It's not manly to express joy. People, <laughs> people on a personal level kind of think that I'm weird because I love and I identify with dogs so much, especially my dogs, especially. Why? Because they know how to experience and express joy. Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, said this one time. He said, we can learn so much by observing the way our pets rejoice in life's simplest moments. For a dog, every morning is Christmas morning. Every walk is the best walk. Every meal is the best meal. And then he says, take time every day to celebrate the many gifts that are hidden in the ordinary events of your life. There is a fine line between genuine, abiding, and the giddiness of joy, and giddiness and joviality. There's a big difference between those. Joy is something we feel not just on the outside, but deep within us. There is a certain joy we may smile about when we think of the time Uncle Roger burned his sleeve on the candle while reaching for the mashed potatoes, or the time Sister Louise dropped the birthday cake. The joy the shepherds felt was overwhelming because they had heard the truth. They had actually seen the truth, and they had experienced the presence of God. Joy. Not giggle and laugh out loud delight, but the warmth and the pervasive, inescapable omnipresence of a great joy that is in your heart and in your life that fills our hearts with a knowledge of God and a relationship with God. I got a mailing from a church a couple weeks ago. It said, Christmas isn't complicated. Christmas isn't complicated, and I think the mailing was right. Christmas isn't complicated. We make it complicated sometimes. We make it hard sometimes. We make it difficult sometimes. But Christmas really isn't complicated. Amid all the decorations and all the gifts and all the parties, there is a simple message. A child was born, and the world was forever changed. Thank God. There is a deep joy waiting to become a part of our lives at Christmas. At Christmas, we should let it in. This Christmas, let's sing with gusto. Let's pray with fervor. Let's tell the story with meaning. Let's really get into Christmas when we enter the world of Christmas, somehow our world has more meaning and the things we do become sacred 
as we do them in a grateful way and, and with joy. I think, I'm not sure, but I think it was Henry David Thoreau who said, most men leave, li sorry, let me start again. Most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. You know, this Christmas, let's let the song of great joy out. Let it flow through each and every one of us. Christmas is all about joy. And this Christmas, if you want joy, if you want an abiding happiness, get as close to the baby Jesus as you can. Amen. In just a moment, I'd like for us to sing a hymn of communion. Do we have that, uh, Steve? Do we have Break Thou the Bread of Life? Do you have that one, uh, Dale? Okay, all right. So let's just go on to uh, communion and celebrate communion this morning. You know, when I stand before this table, it says many, many things to me. As I stand here in great humility, one thing that I thought about was the message that this table has for all of us. And I think there is a wonderful message in this table, I believe that all of us love to get a message. A message is something that's important. It's something that means something to us. I remember a few years ago, there was a movie that came out, Message in a Bottle, and it turned lives around. And you know, I think the message of the table means a lot to all of us. It can turn us all around. It can change our lives. It can make a big difference in our lives. As I was thinking about this, I thought about Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart was born in um, Atchison, Kansas, just a few miles up the road here. And she was the one who made that trip or started that trip around the world. And you know, we, when she took off, we looked forward to the messages that she sent us. This was back in 1937, I believe. And one day she took off on another leg of her journey around the world. He took off, she took off from New Guinea and expecting that day to fly to a place called Howland Island in the Pacific. And we all listened for her message. But we never got her message. There was no message. And Amelia Earhart was lost. But you know, today we stand at this table, and we come to this table to celebrate a great message that God has given us. God has given us a wonderful message. He has sent us a message. He has sent us this wonderful message of hope, this message of, of mercy, this message of assurance, this message of life in a dark world. And so this morning, as we come to this table, let us have a quick prayer. God, thank you for this table. Thank you for the message that you send us. Thank you, God, for all that is wrapped up in this beautiful table that has bread and has the cup. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper together with each other and with you. And so we remember... On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, and then he broke it to symbolize the breaking of his body, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. I'm going to let you now take a bite of the bread, or the cracker, or any form that you would like as we eat the bread that Christ has set the table with and that we eat.
And likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he said, Drink you all of it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. This do in remembrance of me. And so this morning, we partake of the cup. Thank you, God, for this time of communion. Thank you for being present with us as we partake of these symbols. And we know that you are here with us and that you send us a message of love. I'd like for us to bow now for a word of prayer. This is the pastoral prayer, and after I have prayed for a few moments, I'm going to ask each of you to pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Holy and loving God, during this joyful season of waiting, grace us with the presence of mind to be attuned to what this season is all about and just what it is we are celebrating. Let us walk slowly, God, into Advent and wait as Mary did and ponder this wondrous birth instead of racing to the store and racing endlessly searching online and becoming engulfed in mall madness. Let us walk slowly into Advent and watch for the holy happenings that come to us as we journey to Bethlehem. In the midst of December darkness and cold, open our eyes to the gift of light in our lives, the smile of a child, the hug of a friend. In the midst of the cold and the wind, open our hearts to our families gathered here, if not in person, then certainly in our hearts and our minds. In the midst of pen pandemic fear, share with us, God, the delight of music, the aroma of good things baking, and the snowflakes tapping at our faces as we walk toward the warmth of home. And God, let us walk slowly into Advent that we might take note that whenever and wherever and however God comes, even to such a lowly place like a stable, let us watch where we are going as we walk slowly into Advent so that we might kneel and greet the baby with ready and restful hearts. Most gracious God, each of us are on our way to Bethlehem and we travel with gratitude that you are ever with us as we journey. Help us as we journey to stay on the path and keep us focused on the purpose of our mission. We confess, God, that in the busyness of this season, we stray from the holiness of the journey and we sometimes concentrate, concentrate instead on the holiday. We ask, God, that you guide us Shine the eternal light of your star on our journey. And God, as we put up our Christmas lights, might we be reminded of your light. Grant us the patience to pause in our many tasks and relax in the great promise of the star that we follow. As we decorate our trees, let us take time to share the treasured memories of family gatherings so that it is your love that adorns and shines in our homes. As we shop for gifts, keep us mindful of the birthday we celebrate and the gift that we are given in the manger. And God, when we bake cookies and make candy, let us not forget to stir in forgiveness. And let us stir in a little bit of serenity and let us stir in peace and joy and love so that our presence 
reflect the gift of your presence. We are on the way, God, to Bethlehem. We each must answer as to whether there is room inside the inn of our hearts for your Son. Grant that it might also be. Today, God, we offer special prayers for the members and friends of our community and our church, family, who have urgent and pressing needs. We pray today for Ron Bryant, who fell this last week and injured his knees. We pray today, God, for, for Amy, Amy Erickson, that she might continue to feel better. We're so pleased, God, that she is doing better. We pray you'd continue to bless her. Today, God, we pray for Stella Jackson. We pray today, God, for Wanda Kirkland. We pray, God, for Maxine Moore and Molly and Kyle Slocum. We pray for Edith Lavallee. We pray for Phoebe Borkowski. We pray for Bev Rhodes. We pray for Tim Slimp and his health concerns. And God, we, we pray for Dan and the cancer that he has. We pray for Sharon and God and, uh, and Tammy for the rare form of cancer that she has, that it might be under treatment and respond. We pray today, God, for the family and friends of David Fine, who entered new life in heaven this last week. We pray for Donna Crane, because uh, David was her nephew. And today, God, we pray for the family of Tim Slim, who lost his uncle, Darren Daryl Snip, and today, God, we pray for all the others who need your loving care. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to pray, and God, as we continue to worship this day, we offer our prayers in the name of the one whom we wait, the one who walks with us even in our darkest times, Jesus the Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying when we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, one of the things that we do every Sunday is we take an offering. And I was, I was thinking about that sometimes when we play golf, we have a score, scorecard. In baseball and in football and every other sport, we keep score. It's kind of important whether we bet on the score, I hope you don't do too much, or just like to see how we're doing. It's important that we kind of keep track of how we're doing. Are we winning? Are we getting better? Are we growing in what we are doing? I think life is like that. And even though it is difficult sometimes, I think we ought to keep some kind of score on how we're doing, how we're living our lives. Are we getting better? Are we growing in what life really means? When we give, we get a star in our crown, like we used to get a star in school when we learned a concept or passed a test. I think God likes it when we give. To learn to give shows a degree of maturity. It shows a measure of compassion. We know that God gives to us all the time. And I think that it pleases God when we give. You know, there is a beautiful song entitled Pass It On, and it goes like this. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around us can warm up in the glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced you'll, it, you'll spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on. And so this morning, we offer a prayer for our offering today. God, we bring our gifts with gratitude for the opportunity to give. 
We thank you, O Lord, for the bounty that is ours and for the freedom we have to worship as we choose. We are grateful for the endless choices that are ours to ponder and partake. We bring our gifts with hearts full of thanksgiving for all that is ours. We ask only that you would help us to remember. Remember your love and remember your presence. Remember your goodness and remember your blessings. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You know, in just a moment, our wonderful musician, Dale, is going to sing a song, a a hymn of invitation. Before he comes and does that, I'd like to extend an invitation to each of you. As we worship, you know, there is a person. There is a Savior. We celebrate his birth in just a few days. He was born a long time ago, but he lives in our world today. We serve a risen Savior. He's in our world today, and he wants to be in your life. And so this is the invitation that we have this morning to invite Jesus into your life, to make Jesus a part of who you really are. And so this morning, during our song of invitation, would you think about that and meditate on that and give Jesus your heart. He invites you to this day. Sing for us, Dale. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. Fountain I drink from, oh, he is my son. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. Ransom for my life, oh, he is my son. You are good, good.
been a joy to welcome all of you to this service of worship this morning. I do have a couple of announcements. First of all, the administrative support team will be meeting this coming Thursday, the 17th at seven o'clock. And so if you are a part of that, we ask you to be uh, there for that meeting. Also, we have a Friday friendship feast scheduled, but it will not be held in December. So the Friday Friendship Feast is canceled for the month of December. And then a wonderful uh, announcement too, we will be having a Christmas Eve service. It will be a virtual service, not a in-person worship, but I invite all of you to stand by for the exact time of that, but we will be having a Christmas Eve service. And now would you bow for the benediction. May the stars be extra bright, May the song of the angels be clear. May the love of God hold you tight. And may God bring joy to you and all who are near. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go, tell it on the mountain that Yeah. 